people have always felt the need to feel protected from marauding armies or the ravages of nature. When it comes to defending communities, engineering has a key role to play. In this program, we travel to the huge Citadel de Bly in France to look at the work of the great military engineer, Marshal Vauban. Then we move to Holland to grapple with the task of defending a nation against the sea. But we start our story in medieval Scotland. The 14th century in Britain was a dark and difficult time, and those with the means protected themselves and their families by building huge castles to defend their territory against aggressors. Most people's idea of a castle is four walls surrounded by a moat. While many castles use nature to their advantage, at Tantalan this is taken to the extreme. With cliffs on three sides, they only needed one huge wall across the promontory to provide a barrier against attack. In the 14th century, the principles of defense had been unchanged for hundreds of years. Castle walls needed to be high enough and sheer enough to repel borders and solid enough to resist the force of boulders hurled by catapult. Just climbing up inside the great wall. Wonderful tower up here, absolutely amazing. His keep at the east end of the curtain wall is exactly the same width as the wall. Must be all of 12 feet wide. At 12 meters high, the red sandstone wall was an imposing feature on the landscape. With this great curtain wall to protect them and the sea around them, the Earls of Angus and their people lived in this community for over 170 years in comfort and security. Tantalan's reputation grew as one of Scotland's greatest baronial mansions. But following its construction in 1350, gunpowder swept across Europe, revolutionizing warfare, and in 1528, Tantalan faced its first serious test. Seeking to assert his authority over the sixth earl, the young King James V assaulted the castle with a small force, including three cannon, and besieged it for 20 days. It was the first time Tantalan had been attacked by cannon. The castle survived unscathed, but it was clear that strengthening works were needed to resist this new form of weaponry. They strengthened the castle by building a new tower in front of the old one using the distinctive green mudstone that you can see beneath me. The green mudstone was a clever choice. It's much softer than the red sandstone and would help to absorb the impact of cannon fire. You can see how the mudstone has weathered much more quickly than the red sandstone. This is one of the rooms which has been infilled with masonry in an attempt to increase the mass of the curtain wall. What a mess. Perhaps they were concerned that with the new cannons, they would just blast through the door. And they, they therefore assumed that their walls were going to be strong enough. They'd add some stonework and fill in those empty rooms and so on. But uh, they put the, most of their money into this piece of work here to protect the gateway. This is part of the defenses of the castle after 1528. That could do you a lot of damage. It must have been unbelievable in here when that exploded. In the years after the strengthening in 1528, Tantalum was regarded as so well fortified that Henry VIII chose it as the place to store his gold, destined to buy the loyalty of unreliable Scottish lords. But in 1651, Tantalum finally fell to one of Cromwell's armies. Continuous bombardment by 16 cannon over 12 days finally breached the Great Wall. The reason was that the repeated impact, high energy impact of the cannonballs on the same spot of the exposed vertical wall was inevitably going to break through eventually. Medieval design was no match for the new technology. By the time Cromwell's army had laid waste to the once mighty defenses at Tantalan, the castle was some 300 years old and hopelessly out of date. On mainland Europe, 
great fortresses had been built that tackled the problem of cannon fire with defences on a different scale altogether. By the 17th century, warfare on the continent of Europe was a fact of life. It was the age of the siege. The medieval castle was overtaken by an altogether more advanced concept of defence which required a new type of person, the military engineer. It was also a mathematical age, the dawn of the age of reason, the time of Galileo, Descartes, Newton. Mathematical calculation was the key to unlocking the logical harmony of the universe. Symmetry and proportion were the key to design, and fortifications were no exception. Here at the Citadel de Bly in southwest France, there's a classic example of the work of one of the greatest military engineers of all time, Marshal Vauban. The primary function of the fortress at Bly was to guard the mouth of the Gironde estuary and the city of Bordeaux upriver. Vauban's mathematical approach places him in a unique position historically as one of the first to apply a systematic design method to his work. Vauban was a veteran of many sieges and was appointed by Louis XIV personally to oversee the construction of a network of fortresses around the country to defend the nation against invading armies. An awesome responsibility that made him one of the most important men in the country. Castle design had come a long way since Tantalon and fortresses now altered the landscape with massive earthworks to protect against attack. Vauban's contribution was to take state-of-the-art defense ideas and improve them by applying geometrical rules, standardizing the form and method of fortress construction, enabling the entire national defenses to be built to precise instructions. The system of defenses was highly geometric and meticulously thought out. Bly is protected on one side by the Gironde River, on the other side, huge curtain walls surround the fortress with triangular bastions at each corner. Bastions were huge buffers situated in front of the curtain wall. There are four at Bly. Between and in front of the bastions were ravelins. These arrowhead-shaped defences were like small bastions and lower than the defences behind, enabling them to be shot over. Around the whole fortress was a great ditch, Around the outside of the ditch was the glacis, a huge mound built up and around the outside of the fortress to prevent a direct line of fire at the base of the walls. Bly is so big that it's hard to visualise it from the ground. By drawing an overhead plan, we can also see Vauban's method for setting out the fortress. First, he laid out the corners of the bastions at regular distances. Then he mapped out construction lines between the corners and from those lines used his standardized units of measure to determine the angles along which to construct the bastions and the curtain wall. Next, he worked out the position of the ravelins. This was determined by the line of fire from the sides of the bastions. Around the whole fortress, he built up the glassy. And added bridges to connect the ravelins to the curtain wall over the ditch. The key difference between the medieval castle and this fortress is that behind the walls it's backfilled with earth, as you can see on the ravelin behind me. Even if you were to breach the wall with cannon fire, you couldn't just run through. It's a mountain. But these earthworks introduced a new problem, which is where Vauban made his second great contribution to engineering. A wall retaining earth has to support not only itself, but also the pressure of the soil behind it. Too thin, and it will be pushed over. 
too thick and the amount of masonry will be unnecessarily expensive and time-consuming to construct. Engineering is all about risk and return and the price of failure in this case would be defeat in battle. Vauban was committed to building over a hundred fortresses around France, so a standardized approach to design was essential. Vauban decided on a geometric solution to the angle of the wall, depending on its height and the width at the top. This is the top of the wall, the front, and the base. The back of the wall is buried, but it's vertical, like this. Behind the wall is earth, right to the top. The slope of the wall was to be one to five, giving it the stability against overturning that Vauban required. It's hard to find anywhere where we can see the width of the wall clearly, but on top of this ravelin, we can see that the wall is a meter wide. It's seven meters high. Let's go and look at the bottom. The wall's being cut through here to make a door, but we can see the back of the wall is about here, and the front is over here, and it's more than two and a half meters thick at the bottom. From the dish, we get a good idea of the huge scale of the construction. Faubon's works started here in 1685 and took 500 masons four years to complete. Fortunately, they had a good supply of stone in the local quarries. Bly was one of Faubon's early works and is remarkably well preserved. Outside lay the region of Bordeaux and the local community. Inside was the garrison, up to 1,400 men. Bly was never taken. Vauban's network of fortresses gave France the security it needed. Vauban's contribution was that he was the first to appreciate the problem of the pressure of earth on a wall and to propose design solutions. Today he would have been known as a civil engineer. His great insights into siege warfare come from his unparalleled experience, both as an attacker and as a defender, fighting in 50 important sieges in 52 years. During his career, he built or adapted over 150 fortresses in and around France, requiring 10 million tons of masonry, a huge amount of construction work. Vauban's system of defences and the castle in general became redundant when the invention of the howitzer enabled shells to be lobbed over the walls from a distance. Today, massive earth defences are more likely to be defending nations from nature than from marauding armies, but the engineering problems are every bit as challenging. The Dutch people have always lived with the threat of being overrun by water. But on the 1st of February 1953, a huge storm surge took them by surprise, breaching the sea defences in 67 places. 1,800 people drowned. For centuries, the Dutch had relied on dunes and local dikes for protection from the sea, but it was clear this was not enough. The survival of a nation was at stake. The Dutch government concluded that the entire coastline should be protected by a system of dikes and barriers to be called the Delta Sea Project. It was to be hugely expensive, but the alternative was too terrible to contemplate. The Dutch have a long history of dike design. Dikes have to support not only their own weight, but the force of water against them. Any weak spot in the dike and the whole system of defenses can crumble. 
The big question is how high the dike should be. In 1953, recognizing the problem of rising sea levels and the unpredictability of great storms, the Dutch government opted for a level at least a meter higher than the terrible flood. There was a huge amount at stake. The length of the coastline is enormous. A balance has to be struck between the cost and time of construction of a high dike and the value you place on people's safety. It's a tough decision, whether it's your own home or your country that's at stake. One of the last closures was the most difficult of all, the estuary of the East Scheldt, or Oosterscheldt. The original plan was for a dam to keep out the tide, but this would destroy the sensitive ecosystem of the estuary. Instead, the Dutch opted for a vast barrier with gates that could close in the event of a storm surge. The strong currents and the shifting sand in the East Scheldt made the construction of the barrier extremely difficult. As you'll remember from walking on the beach, when you fiddle around with your feet in the sand, you sink in and the sea can easily wash it around your feet. So you need to densify it, you need to compact it first of all to provide the base that you need for a great structure like this. And that's exactly what they did. The contractors compacted the seabed and laid a vast mattress of stones and sand to provide a solid foundation on which to place the 65 piers that link the barrier gates over a distance of three kilometers. For almost all their lives, these gates will be open and the sea is free to pass in and out of the estuary beneath us. But when the storm surge comes, the gates are all that is between the people of Holland to my right and the sea out there. They have to work. Like a guillotine, each of the 500 ton gates is lowered into position. They'd have a lot of warning, maybe hours, of the arrival of the storm surge, but they can shut the whole barrier in 90 minutes. Of course, it doesn't have to be watertight. They only have to hold out the surge during the high tide. After the tide has passed, then the danger has receded. Thankfully, the gates have never had to be used in anger, although they have a drill every year to make sure the gates will function in the event of a surge. Behind the huge black gates here, with the estuary to my left and the sea out there, we can see the top of the great concrete piers. Each of them is the height of a 15-story building, but there's only a quarter visible above the sea. The water here is up to 30 meters deep. The piers support the machinery for the gates up there and a, a concrete road bridge over here. The gigantic piers are hollow and were constructed in huge dry docks before being floated out into position. The construction and installation of the piers took over four years. There's 18,000 tons of concrete in each one. At the base, they're shaped like a gold ingot lined up in this direction to give them the stability against the storm forces from the sea. Once they were in position, they were sunk onto the seabed and ballasted with another 12,000 tons of sand in each one. To protect them against scour from the tides, they imported at huge cost stone from as far away as Finland. It took five million tons to cover the entire three kilometer length of the barrier. But the biggest challenge was to align them perfectly within centimeters to allow the great steel gates to go up and down, out here practically in the open sea. Oh, 
little swindy. This is the base of the hydraulic cylinder and the piston that holds the gate up in position in its normal state. It's connected to the gate by the giant pin down there. So when the gate's triggered, the whole thing drops into the sea. Push. Brilliant. The framing on the front of the gate gives it the stiffness that it needs against the force of the storm surge. It's very dramatic. You can see the tide now driving in underneath it. The tide's now going at full tilt, and you can really get an idea of the forces on the concrete sill beneath me and on the piers and on the stone out there in the sea. Just imagine that huge weight of water flooding through. In fact, it's very like what would happen if a dike was breached. You could imagine that flooding a polder in no time at all. And if you think this is exciting, on the last pier there's a marker where the 1953 flood level in this part of Holland reached. We're a long way below it today, luckily. The barrier was completed in 1986 at a third of the cost of the entire Delta C project and three times as much as the cost of a simple dam. But it's a testament to modern civil engineering, providing defense for the people of Holland while maintaining the natural habitat of the tidal estuary. Not many countries can afford the Dutch approach, but balancing the environmental issues with society's aspirations for security, whether physical or financial, is at the heart of the civil engineer's role throughout the world. One thing is for certain. The battle to ensure the survival of the human race as our environment continues to change means the civil engineer will remain on the front line, defending us from the elements. Next, we look at the cantilever bridge in its many guises. We start with the simple but elegant Kingsgate footbridge in Durham, northeast England, then explore the vast expanse of the fourth rail bridge in Scotland and finish in Seville, Spain, to look at the outlandish Alamillo Bridge. 